Al Asr brings you The Messengers by Sheikh Maiz Bukhari. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A kind request, uh, can you please come forward and fill up the gaps? Just to make the gathering look uh, complete, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Please come forward. Don't disturb the ones who are praying. It helps me to connect with you as well. <coughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah سبحانه وتعالى who is no doubt our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector, and curer. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his choicest of blessings and salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, his family members, his companions, and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, like I mentioned in the previous session, we have a little more to cover from the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam before we proceed on to the other prophets alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, we have come to the latter stages of the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam and an interesting incident takes place during uh, the latter stages of his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this interesting, beautiful incident in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah azza wa jal states, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى قَالَ أَبَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قَالَ بَلَهَا وَلَكِنْ لِيَطْمَئِنَّ قَلْبِي قَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِّنَ الطَّيْرِ فَصُرْهُنَّ إِلَيْكَ ثُمَّ جَعَلْ عَلَى كُلِّ جَبَلِهِمْ مِّنْهُنَّ جُزْءًا ثم ادعهن ياتهنك سعيا واعلم ان الله عزيز حكيم and remember what is قال ابراهيم رب ارني كيف تحيي الموتى and remember when ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam he said oh allah show me how you give life unto the dead رب ارني كيف تحيي الموتى Show me how you give life unto the dead. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Qala abalam tu'min ya Ibrahim. O Ibrahim, do you not believe? Or have you not brought in iman that I can give life unto dead, unto the dead? Qala bala. Now he replies, of course, I believe ya Allah. Wala kin liyatuma inna qalbi. But this is just to, you know, give me more faith and fill my heart with faith and to uh, give me a, a deeper and stronger conviction. It is to strengthen my iman. قَالَ بَلَا وَلَكِنْ لِيَتُمَا إِنَّ قَلْبِ Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, not just any ordinary prophet. He was the khalil of Allah, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must dispel any doubts that may crop in our hearts that perhaps, you know, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was in doubt. No, he was not in doubt at all. It was just that he wanted to strengthen his faith he wanted to strengthen his conviction and this is why he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah azza wa jal commands Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam to catch four birds. To catch four birds. Qala fakhud arba'atam min at Catch four birds. Now you need to understand that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam was old. Like I said, this was towards the latter stages of his life. Being an old man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to catch four birds. It's not easy. It's a difficult task to catch four birds. To catch four birds. Wild birds, that too. فَصُرْهُنَّ إِلَيْكَ Now after catching the four birds, now train these four birds to come to you whenever you call them. Whenever you call them. I'm sure it's a pretty challenging task to catch four birds and that too he's an old man catch four birds and now train the birds whenever you call them like say you name a bird Polly, Kiki, whatever you name the bird then you call the bird the bird must come I mean that that's actually a very difficult task to train the bird to that extent so after you have trained the birds now 
ثم جعل على كل جبل منهن جزءا now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam slaughter the birds slaughter the birds and cut up the flesh of the birds into little cubes little pieces and now you've got bird A, bird B, bird C and bird D cut up the four birds in the sense slaughter the four birds cut their flesh into pieces and now mix it all up mix it all up so you've got the pieces of bird A mixed with bird B mixed with bird C, bird D mix it all up and divide now divide the mixed up flesh into four portions and place each portion place each portion on the peak of a mountain on the peak of a mountain so you've got four portions four mountains Allahu Akbar old man has to climb four mountains four mountains to place the flesh the mixed up flesh on the peak of each mountain so he had to I don't think any of us have even climbed one mountain Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had to climb four mountains so scholars rahimahumullah state that it is not easy to learn the lessons of Iman you have to go through a bit of a struggle a bit of hardship to bring in Iman and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam is just amazing his story there are like so many lessons that an individual can derive I mean you can just take one part of his life and discuss about it derive lessons Allahu Akbar but as we have to continue with the story we will go on inshallah ta'ala so he slaughters the birds mixes up the flesh now it's got four portions he goes and places it on top of each mountain four mountains and now he comes back and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states now Call each bird and each bird will come to you Sa'ya. They'll come to you swiftly. Allahu Akbar. So he comes down from the four mountains. He calls each bird. Lo and behold, the pieces of flesh, the cubes of flesh start to form. Because, now for example, if bird A were to form, birds, bird A's flesh might be on mountain A, mountain B, mountain C, mountain D. So the pieces of flesh started to form from each mountain and it started to become whole again. It became bird A and it flies to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And now Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam witnesses this great miracle, this great sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It fills his heart with even more faith. Allahu Akbar. The iman of the anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, I think I mentioned this in the first or the second session, their iman is always soaring higher and higher. Day by day, their iman soars higher and higher. We, on the other hand, our iman drops, our iman plummets, our iman goes up. The iman of the angels stationary; it does not move. That's why la yasun Allah ma amarahum wa yafaluna ma yumarun. They don't uh, disobey Allah subhanahu wa taala. They do what Allah subhanahu wa taala has commanded them to do. So now, the iman of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam soars. He's filled with even more iman because he's witnessing. First hand, this great sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was an interesting incident that took place during the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa Because sometimes people have the doubt, like say for example, if someone were to drown, Allah forbid, Allah protect us all. And if a fish were to eat up that individual or if the, the, the fish of the ocean were to eat up that individual, is it possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back that individual? It is completely possible. It is completely possible. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be buried in one place for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resurrect you. Allah Azza wa Jal is the most powerful. In Allah Qadir, Allah is capable of doing whatever He wills. So this story took place during the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now another incident that took place was that after a period of time, we mentioned that Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam was now, he had settled in Mecca. So scholars state that he was the first of the Musta'ariba. You have original Arabs. Now the original Arabs were the Arabs who came and settled in Mecca, like we discussed in the previous session. They came and settled, they came and asked Hajar, the mother of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, permission to settle down and they settled there in Mecca. They were the original Arabs. Now, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, on the other hand, he was the first of the Musta'ariba. Musta'ariba in the sense, he learned the, he learned the Arabic language from these original Arabs. He learned the Arabic language from these original Arabs and he learned the fluent 
Al-Fusha, the, the fluent Arabic language from these Arabs. So he is known as the first of the Musta'riba. Musta'riba in the sense who perhaps like borrowed the Arabic language from the original Arabs and that's where this line of Arabs uh, began. And until today, most of them are the Musta'riba. They are from the lineage of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. So was our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So he was the first of the Musta'riba to speak eloquent Arabic and the first of them to ride horses as well. He was the first of them to speak eloquent Arabic and he was the first of them to ride horses as well. He was a noble man of his word. Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam was a noble man of his word. He would never ever break his promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about him in the noble Quran. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّةِ and mention in the book, the Quran, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. Verily, he was true to his word, to what he promised. And he was a messenger, a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after a period of time, now uh, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, he marries. He gets married in, in Mecca. And like I mentioned yesterday, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam had the habit of visiting his wife Hajar and his son Ismail alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam in Mecca. And he used to spend some time in Palestine with his wife Sarah and his son Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam as well. So this was the way Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam used to visit one family after the other. So once Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam visits his son and on that day Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam had promised an individual something. He had promised an individual something and he was gone a complete day. Because of that promise, he was trying to fulfill that promise, and he was gone a complete day. Now, time passes, and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he, you know, he was waiting the whole day. So he thought, Let's, let me go uh, visit the, the house of my son. He goes to the house of his son, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, and he knocks the door. Now, like I said, Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam was out. A lady opens the door and she asks Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, yes, what can I do for you? Who are you? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked her, uh, where is Ismail? I wish to meet Ismail. Uh, well, Ismail has gone out. He's gone out, you know, for, to run some errands. He's gone out. So what can I do for you? So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam then asks her, asks her so who are you? Uh, then she says, I I'm his wife. And then he asks, uh, oh, good. Uh, how do you find life uh, with Ismail? And you know, in general, how's life? He asks. Her. She says, uh, "Well, you know, it's okay. We are barely making ends meet. It's actually very difficult, and uh, we don't have much food. Uh, we find it very difficult. Uh, you know, we are actually struggling." And she goes on. You know, it starts off with okay, and then she starts to complain, nag, and you know, grumble about uh, life with Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam listened to her. She did not know that she was talking to her father-in-law. She didn't know about it. So she kept on grumbling, complaining, whining away. So after she had done with all her complaining, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam then told her, okay, fine, I'll take your leave now. Uh, just uh, please convey my salams and my regards to Ismail. Uh, tell him that I, Ibrahim, came and went and just tell him to change his doorstep, to change his doorstep. This was the tiny piece of advice. You know, this was like a code between father and son. They had a code uh, language between father and son. And he leaves. Ismail wasalam, comes in the evening and, you know, in some way or the other, he just sensed the presence of his father. Perhaps he could smell, uh, you know, the, perhaps the idr or something that Ibrahim wasalam, could have used at that time. So he asks his wife, did anybody come searching for me? To which she replied, yes, an old man, he came and he asked for you. Oh, okay, what did he say? Oh, he said his name was Ibrahim, and uh, he just asked about life and all of that. And yes, towards the end, just as he was about to leave, he wanted you to change your doorstep. He wanted you to change your doorstep. Ismail, alayhi salatu wasalam, he understood what his father had meant. He understood what his father had meant. His father had wanted him at that time to divorce his wife because his wife was not 
an appropriate companion for him. She was not a compatible match. And this was something that Ibrahim والسلام, had gauged and realized at the very first meeting with his daughter-in-law at that time. So Ismail والسلام, immediately obeys his father. Look, another lesson. Like I said the other day, our parents are of utmost importance, you understand? We must try, strive to uh, listen to our parents, respect our parents, you know? And even if we disagree at times, we must be able to respectfully disagree. And we should not let things uh, fester and dwell for too long, where things go so sour with our parents that we can't even face our parents. Allahu Akbar. Like I said in the previous session, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about worship, wa'budullaha wa la tushriku bihi shay'an wa bil walidayn. Allah couples it generally with good treatment of one's parents. Treat your parents with ihsan. Treat your parents with excellence upon excellence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to treat our parents in the very best manner possible. Ameen. Now some time passes. Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam gets married again. And once again Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam pays a visit. The same thing happens. Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam was out. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam knocks the door. A lady opens the door. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam strikes a conversation with her. He asks her, who are you? She says, I'm Ismail's wife. Uh, okay, how's life? And she goes on to say, you know, life is really good. So she was a positive individual. Whereas the earlier individual was a negative individual. Now this wife was an optimist. The other wife was a pessimist. She, look, she used to look at everything from a negative angle. So here too you understand in this story, it's of utmost importance that we as spouses in a relationship, in, in a marriage, we both have to be optimists. We need to be positive. Because after all, we are following Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was the greatest optimist to ever walk on the face of this earth. Allahu Akbar. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He used to look at everything from a positive angle. And if you too look at everything in your life through the lens of positivity, you'll be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You'll be able to make the best out of your life. You're not going to grumble. You're not going to complain. Because at times we look around us and we try to make excuses to be unhappy. We try. Oh, you know, my life sucks, this, that, my parents are treating me bad, my wife is this, my husband is that. And you know, we, we try to uh, grumble and complain. We make so many excuses to be unhappy. But in reality, if we were to look around us, if we were to just shift our perspectives a bit, and if we were to look around, we would realize that we have so much with us to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So let us render gratitude unto Allah azza wa jal. So this lady, she goes on to say, you know, life is good with uh, Ismail. Even though, you know, we have little, but there is barakah. And we are happy at the end of the day. We live in a small house, but we are happy. We call it home. We are happy. And she started to talk all good things. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam listened to all that she had to say. And then finally he said, please convey my salams and my regards to Ismail and tell him that I stop by and also tell him to hold on to his doorstep very well. Hold on to his doorstep very well. And Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam leaves. Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, he comes in the evening, he senses that his father may have come to see him. He asks his wife, did anybody come to see me? She says, yes, an old man, he came asking for you. And then she told him, all of that have what, have what they you know conversed and spoke about and she said finally he asked me to convey this piece of instruction to you and he wanted you to hold on to your doorstep firmly hold on to your doorstep firmly so from this Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam understood the message of his father and that was that his wife, this wife, is a suitable companion, is an appropriate, compatible match for him and that he should strive to protect the marriage between himself and his wife. And this was another incident that took place during the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Now my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, time passes and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam gets older and older. So the time for him to pass on and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now comes and he is in the throes of death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the agonies of death for all of us. Ameen. The father of all prophets, the greatest of them all after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The greatest prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. A khalil of Allah, the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He now passes away. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam passes away. And Allah azza wa jal, what does he do? He places him by Baytul Mahmur which is a house of Allah in the heavens. When the Kaaba was put up, when the Kaaba was built, right in alignment to the Kaaba, 
there is a house of Allah in the heavens known as Baytul Ma'mur. And according to the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, every single day, every single day, 70,000 angels go into Baytul Ma'mur and they make tawaf of Baytul Ma'mur and they never, uh, they never come out again. 70,000, every single day. 70,000 angels, they go in, they make tawaf of Baytul Ma'mur and they come out. And they're never seen again. This is how vast the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allahu Akbar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam by Baytul Ma'mur as a reward for all the hardship he went through, for all of the sacrifices he went through. The reward was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed him by Baytul Ma'mur. And with that, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam comes to an end. Now very swiftly, talking about Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam, there's actually not... A lot to talk about him. In regard to him, he was the great great grandfather of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. As the lineage of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam traces back to Ismail alaihi salatu wasallam. So after a period of time, after the demise, after the death of Ibrahim alaihi salatu wasallam, Ismail alaihi salatu wasallam passes away as well. He was established in Mecca, so he passes away in Mecca and he was buried in Mecca. Ismail alaihi salatu wasallam. Now let's talk a little about Ishaq. Alayhi salatu was salam. He was the, uh, uh, the, he was the uh, stepbrother, the, the consanguine brother of Ismail. Consanguine in the sense, uh, they both shared the same father but not the same mother. They both shared the same father. Ishaq and Ismail, alayhi salatu was salam, they both shared the same father but not the same mother, as we all know, because the mother of Ishaq, alayhi salatu was salam, was Sarah, alayhi salatu was salam, and the mother of Ismail was Hajar. Alayhi salatu was salam. Their father was one. He was Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. So they were two brothers, consanguine brothers. They shared the same father but different mothers. Now Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam, he too got married. Now where was he? He was in Palestine with Sarah alayhi salatu was salam, like we mentioned earlier. So he gets married and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with twins. Two young boys, two sons. He was blessed with twins. One boy was named as Is and the other was named as Ya'qub. One was named as Is and the other Ya'qub. Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam, later, be, later he becomes a prophet. He was also known as Israel, Ya'qub. These are few important facts. So that's why I'm mentioning it. You'll understand as we go further, inshallah. Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam was also known as Israel. So the prophets and nations after Ya'qub alayhi salatu was salam were all known as, can someone tell me? Banu Israel. They were all known as Banu. Just checking whether you are awake. They were all known as Banu Israel because Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, he was Israel. The nations and the prophets after him were all known as Banu Israel. In other words, the children of Israel. Now, who is this Israel? He is Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, after a period of time, there was a harsh argument that took place between the two brothers, between Is and Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, the two children of Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam. And because of this argument, the mother, the wife of Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam, had to send Yaqub away, had to send Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam to his uncle named Laban. His, na his name was Laban. He, she actually sent Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam to him to avoid further arguments between the two brothers because the arguments kept increasing day by day and she wanted to avoid further strife between the two. So she sent Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam to stay with his uncle. After a long period of time now, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam marries his cousin sister, the daughter of his uncle. Her name was Leah. Her name was Leah. Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam marries the daughter of his uncle, his own cousin sister. Her name was Leah. And later on, he married her younger sister as well. Her name was Rahil. Her name was Rahil. Now, according to the Sharia at that time, according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time, it was permissible to get married to two sisters at the same time. According to our Sharia, it is not permissible. It is not permissible. As long as, for example, the first wife is alive, you cannot get married to your wife's sister. But after the death of your wife, yes, you can marry your wife's sister. But at that time, according to the Sharia, it was permissible to simultaneously get married to two sisters. So he married Leah as well as Rahil. So the first wife, the first wife, Leah, she gives birth to 12 sons. She gives birth to 12 sons and they were known as 
uh, they were known as the Asbat. They were known as the Asbat, the 12 sons of Leah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks and mentions the Asbat in a, a few places in the Noble Quran. Say, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Qul amanna billahi wa ma unzila alayna wa ma unzila ala Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Ya'qub. وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَسْبَاطِ وَمَا أُوْتِيَ مُوسَى وَعِيسَى وَالنَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ سَيْئَوْ مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ آمَنَّا We believe in Allah and we believe وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْنَا We believe in what has been sent down to us, i.e. the Qur'an. وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ And we also believe and confirm in regard to what had been sent down to Ibrahim, sent down to Ismail, sent down to Ishaq, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam and that which was sent down to the Asbat. Now the Asbat were the twelve sons of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I said earlier, mentions Asbat in other places in the Noble Quran as well. Now the second wife, Rahil, she gives birth to two sons, one who was an extremely handsome boy. His name was Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. His name was Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, the son of Yaqub, who was the son of Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam. According to the words of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was Yusuf ibn Karim, ibn Karim, ibn Karim, ibn Karim. He was Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, the son of a noble individual who was Yaqub, the son of Ishaq, who was also a noble individual. They're all prophets, the son of Ibrahim, the Khalil of Allah. The Khalil of Allah. And the second son from Rahil, the second son, his name was Binyamin. His name was Binyamin. So this is a little background about the family of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. So when we go and discuss about the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, it will be a lot easier in the near future, inshallah ta'ala. So now after a very long period, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, he yearns to visit his parents and his brother. Which brother? Is the one he had an argument long time back. So now this is after a very long period. Now he's got married, he's got 12 sons, he's got another two sons. So all in total he had 14 sons. So he, his wives, sons, all of them, they undertake a long journey to go visit his parents and his brother. During the journey, they stop for some time at a place later to be known as Al-Qudus. Later to be known as Al-Qudus. And at that location, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, he built a house of Allah for Allah to be worshipped. And that masjid, that house of Allah was known as Bayt al-Maqdis. Until today, Bayt al-Maqdis. So it was Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam who built that house. So now he reaches his motherland. His parents had become very old and frail now because it is after a long period of time. His parents, in other words, Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam and his wife, they had become very old and whilst he was with them, they pass away. They pass away. And with that, the story of Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam as well as Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam comes to an end. And I know you might be thinking that we are close to discussing the interesting story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. But we have to discuss the story of the Prophet Lut alayhi salatu wasalam first as his story took place during the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And if you are all with me, we're still the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam even though we fast forward quickly until Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. So now let us rewind back to the migration of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. What did we say? Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam migrated with Sarah alayhi salatu wasalam, his wife, and one more individual, his nephew, Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. These were the three people who migrated from Iraq to where? Palestine. So after reaching Palestine, because even a brother asked me yesterday as to what happened to Lut alayhi salatu wasalam, they, they migrated together, and then suddenly he went missing from the story. Now here's the story we are going to discuss about Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. As they reached Palestine, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Lut alayhi salatu wasalam was, had now been appointed as a prophet, as a prophet, and uh, you know, don't think of it as uh, something, um, you know, confusing. 
at a given time there would be two three prophets appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well I mean look at the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam whilst he was a prophet Harun alayhi salatu wasalam was also appointed as a prophet so at the time when Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was a prophet even Lut alayhi salatu wasalam was appointed as a prophet so Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam he sends Lut alayhi salatu wasalam to the villages of Sadum in English Sodom he sends Lut alayhi salatu wasalam to the villages of Sadum now this location is currently where the Dead Sea is located. Currently, where the Dead Sea is located. The people of those villages were large in number. They were large in number. And they, as usual, had started to commit shirk. They had started to commit shirk. They had started to associate partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, they were involved in a whole list of crimes. A whole list of crimes. They were involved in, in sexual intercourse outside the parameters of marriage. They, were, uh, they used to leave their wives to indulge, indulge in sexual relations with men with the same gender. They used to rape others. They were involved in a whole list of crimes. They were a wild and vulgar nation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them in the Noble Quran. وَلُوطًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ أَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُبْصِرُونَ And remember Lut, the Prophet Lot, when he said to his people, when he said to his people, إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ أَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُبْصِرُونَ Do you commit fahisha? Fahisha in the sense, while, evil deeds. It's very broad because they used to commit a lot of evil deeds. So do you commit evil deeds whilst you can clearly see, whilst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to see what is the truth, do you commit all this fahisha? Do you approach men in your lusts rather than women? Like I said earlier, they would leave their wives and approach men. And Lut alayhi salatu wasalam went on to say, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجْهَلُونَ Nay, but you are a people who believe senselessly. Now let us pause for a moment and in the few minutes that I have, let's talk about homosexuality. A sensitive topic these days. So what does Islam exactly say about homosexuality? Islam is crystal clear in its prohibition of homosexual acts. Okay, as it clashes with the natural way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God has created us. It clashes. Nor does it serve the purpose of procreation, reproduction, which is one of the biggest objectives behind the institution of marriage. But today, today, you know, I'm sure most of you are aware, recently uh, they legalized same-sex uh, marriages and all of that. They had uh, gay pride par parades and things like that. So today, the contemporary discussion about homosexual marriage is more political, same-sex marriages is more political. Those in favor of homosexual marriages believe that the gays are being denied certain rights that straight couples are enjoying because of being in a heterosexual union, because of being in a heterosexual marriage. So they consider this discriminatory. They consider this unfair that straight couples, normal couples, have rights, privileges and benefits that they don't have, that homosexual couples do not enjoy. So they think it is unfair just because of their sexual orientation they have been deprived of these rights privileges and so-called benefits so these individuals the ones who are in favor of same-sex marriages they don't call for the the elimination of all the rights privileges and benefits that are being given to straight couples they just want expansion this is what they portray they want an expansion they want gay people to receive the same rights privileges and benefits that straight people straight married couples receive but sadly, they don't realize that the institution of marriage comes with so many strings attached, so many strings of responsibility attached, like, for example, that of children. That of children, which is a huge, big responsibility for a married couple. So the rights and privileges that are there for a straight married couple are there to protect the woman and child during an event of a divorce, separation, etc. So this is why we have certain rights and privileges that have been uh, given in, in, in different countries for straight ma married couples. Anyway, this is just a glimpse into the contemporary discussion. As for Islam, we Muslims are not homophobic. Now you have this 
term that is being you know thrown all over the place homophobia where people are scared and have this uh, paranoia and this fear towards homosexual people we are not homophobic towards homosexuals nor are we in favor of discrimination but as muslims we deem homosexual acts as wrong and immoral according to our religion we deem them wrong so just because of that how can we be considered you know uh, narrow minded how can we be considered bigots for that for for deeming homosexual acts to be wrong just as how you have people vegans who are people who adhere very strictly to veganism veganism in the sense they only consume vegetables they don't tolerate any form of exploitation any form of cruelty towards animals they don't tolerate they are strict followers of veganism now can we say that the people who follow veganism have got meatophobia where they are scared of meat can we say that or, or people who consume meat you and i we all consume meat can we say that the people who strictly follow veganism uh, they, they they suffer from meatophobia that they, you know you know what they've got meatophobia they're scared of meat they're scared of us we can't say that you have kleptomaniacs people who are addicted to stealing kleptomania you have people they, they may be even rich people but whenever they go to a a store or somewhere they get a kick out of stealing things out of stealing things and they like to steal you know it's part of their addiction so can we now i'm 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 sure you know we are all against stealing so does that mean that we have all got kleptophobia that or if, if you are against stealing your theftophobia if you are against alcohol alcoholophobia no it's not like that i mean we, we must be able to today what's happening is that muslims are in such a confusion in regard to how much an individual should compromise and how much one should not compromise in regard to one's values beliefs and principles of islam of the, of the religion you know this is all in the name of modernity you see so much of modernity around you modernity has changed so much around us look even the term family the traditional term it's a landmark institution family we are all familiar with it family has been redefined what was it before a father a mother a couple of children makes a family a family unit but today now it has been redefined to incorporate same sex marriages uh, you know unmarried couples this term has been redefined in the name of modernity so as muslims how much are we to embrace of this modernity we can embrace certain elements of modernity we are a tolerant people we can embrace as long as we do not compromise our values beliefs and principles of islam this is what is of utmost importance we must be very careful so when i say that we are not homophobic we do not detest someone just because he or she is a homosexual because our religion does not punish us for the impulses and incl in inclinations that run in our minds say for example what does islam teach us if an evil thought comes in your mind if an evil thoughts if an evil thought comes in your mind say let's say you intentionally want to break your fast fasting in ramadan is obligatory upon all of us right say you intentionally intend to break your fast will you be considered a sinner you have not acted upon it it's just cropped up in your heart there's just this inclination if you don't act upon it if you shun it away my dear brother you are going to be rewarded by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say you are thinking of committing an illicit act with a woman say allah forbid thoughts of fornication thoughts of adultery crop in your heart as human beings desires come in our heart we are supposed to curb these desires say if something haram pops in our heart as long as we don't act upon that desire and even more if you shun it away you're going to be rewarded by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're going to be rewarded but say you act upon it that's when you are considered a sinner but on the other hand when we talk about good deeds if you even intend a good deed a reward is written for you by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just for intending a good deed and when you act upon that intention and do the good deed the reward is multiplied for you by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how beautiful our religion is so talking about homosexual because some people say that we are born homosexual certain people 
This is something between them and God, between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are nobody to judge. And according to us, what we say is that, okay, fine, you may be a homosexual. We're not homophobic towards you, but we deem homosexual acts as wrong and immoral. And all we can say is that in our religion, you do not have a legal outlet, a permissible outlet of releasing your desires. You cannot indulge in homosexual acts. So you can be a homosexual, but it, it, it's a battle for you. You need to curb those desires. Just as how an alcoholic, what is it? He's addicted to alcohol. But does Islam allow the consumption of alcohol? Can he say, no, I'm an alcoholic, so I need to consume alcohol? No. And, and also, just because he says that he's an alcoholic, can we detest him? Does Islam teach us that? To detest him, to chase him away? Can we chase him away from the masjid? Can we detest him? Is that the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. We must welcome him into our worship spaces and all of that. But still, we will not condone, we will not allow him to consume alcohol. Or rather, if he does it on his own, that's a different story. But in front of us, we cannot deem that as permissible. We cannot deem that as permissible. And for him, it's a battle. And if he does not act upon his desires, if he does not act upon his desires, and if he controls and curbs his desires, he's going to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all we say is that there is no legal permissible avenue for a homosexual to indulge in his or her desires in our religion. Ergo, we refuse to celebrate a law that openly legalizes and permits what our religion deems immoral. Simple as that. And for that, we cannot be considered bigots. We cannot be considered narrow-minded, intolerant people. Now, a few days back, you saw so many people sporting the rainbow colors and whatnot. But as believers, as Muslims, we refuse to celebrate a law that openly legalizes and permits that which Islam deems as immoral. But we are not homophobic towards them. If they do not share our faith, they are free to do whatever they want to do. They are answerable to God. That's up to them. But in our religion, within the parameters and the guidelines of Sharia, it is not permissible for us to deem such acts as lawful. So with that, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I conclude. But what's important is that we must be able to strike a balance. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that we have made you a moderate and balanced nation. We must not give in to extreme ideologies. Either way, you know, not too modern, not too traditional. We must always be able to strike a balance in the middle. And like I said earlier, we can embrace modernity as long as we do not compromise the teachings and values of Islam. So with that, I conclude today's session, inshallah ta'ala. Tomorrow, we will continue with the story of Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. I look forward to talking to you all tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.